Welcome to Resiliency Within. I'm your host, Elaine miller Karras, and my guest today is Mariel Schindler. She is an employment lawyer, partner, and head of a team at Withers LLP, a law firm with office, offices in London and California, and is a patron of Arvon, the writing charity. She lives in London with her husband, Jeremy, and, his, and has three children. She is also an author of The Lost Cafe Schindler, One Family, Two Wars, and The Search for Truth. It is my honor to have her come on the show because she is going to share with us really what I guess we'll call the reclamation and re reconciliation that also has happened from your authorship of this wonderful, wonderful book. Um, so she's going to share her journey um, with us. And as she recounts the history of an extraordinary family, The Lost Cafe Schindler is a story of a, a tragic loss. Several of Mariel's relatives disappeared in Terezin and Auschwitz, but also one of reclamation and reconciliation. It is an unforgettable portrait of an era and a testament to the pull that family history has on future generations. So important for us to remember that now in the world that we're living in and how our lived history historical past affects the present. She will share details of her difficult relationship with her father and the tales he told. We were talking before the show started that he was quite a character, but it also, it really compelled her to research after he died. And so she could unravel the history um, to lead to the truth. So you'll see that the narrative is gonna center around the Cafe Schindler, the social hub of Innsbruck, Austria. Famous for its pastries, home distilled liquors, live entertainment and hospitality, the cafe became an eyewitness to the history of those times. And as conditions became untenable for Jews in Austria during the Nazi era, the Schindlers were forced to leave and their cafe was expropriated. As she unravels her family history, including the truth behind what happened when the Nazis beat her grandfather and left him for dead, Mariel also tells the untold story of the fate of the Jews of Western Austria. She reconstructs the color and vibrancy of life in pre-war pre Innsbruck against this maj majestic backdrop of the Austrian Alps, as well as the rise of anti-Semitism and the Nazi occupation. I also wanna add something that just happened just today. Um, and Mariel, would you like to share, I would love to hear your words about this, but the Jewish Book Council just gave your book an amazing honor. Could you share with us what just happened today? Yes, thank you so much, Elaine, for inviting me on your show. It's truly an honor. Um, I'm very, very delighted to be here. And you're quite right. The Jewish Book Council sent me an email just a couple of hours ago, recommending my book as one of eight books to read for Hanukkah. So I was very pleased about that. Um, that was truly an honor. Well, so thank you very I, much. I am so um, honored to have you on the show and also feel honored to be here when you have received this auspicious honor today. So, um, so I'm hoping that everyone who's listening will pick up this wonderful book and start to read it. Um, no matter what your what holiday that you may celebrate, because I think it's really a book for all times and all people. Um, you and I were talking um, as well about um, just there has been a rise in some of the vitriol of anti-Semitism lately. And I think we can also learn from our past. And I think that you chronicle what happened during those times in, a, in, in an amazing way. But let's get started. I have a question uh, for you. Um, as I was reading your book, I was struck of, about the trauma you experienced um, due to the unpredictable nature of your dad. Um, so what helped you get through those challenging times? I mean, here you are an attorney, an accomplished woman in the world. You know, what helped you? Well, let's talk a little bit about the trauma itself in the sense that it, this wasn't physical trauma. This was more around the instability of a family. And my father was tall, handsome, good looking, um, a brilliant raconteur and persuasive. And he also had, however, a very difficult relationship with truth. He, he, he didn't always, he, you know, he sometimes just lied basically. And I think it was growing up in that environment that was very difficult. And we, you know, he, he tended to run businesses, my father, and run them very badly. They were often run into bankruptcy. And um, 
we often had bailiffs at the door and creditors banging on the door and that that meant that we had a very unstable childhood and and this was during your childhood i mean in when you were yeah. you know in your um adolescence the tween years this was all happening and so you were witnessing all this and but there was something you said about you that i would love for you to share because that was all happening as the backdrop but here we yeah. have this young woman who's observing all this and what was it about you that so that that was just to give some sense of the of the instability yeah. of the childhood and you asked me what helped me get through it and i think what helped me get through it was i was a very self-reliant child i very early on recognized that i could not rely on my parents really financially for support um and that i needed to make sure i looked after myself and that that i was essentially financially independent from the age of 17. So um, I also, uh, you shared with me a story about that when you wanted to go to uh, university, um, knowing that you didn't have the funds and you couldn't rely on your parents, that you actually went on a little personal trek. And can you share with us that story? Because I just thought that was lovely. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I got to university and realized that I wasn't going to be funded by the British government at the time. Universities were free in, 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 in England. They are no longer free, unfortunately. And um, I, I, it was quite a shock to find that I wasn't going to be funded and wasn't going to get a grant. And so I, I went to the library. I, I, first of all, I got myself a job and then I went to the library and I also looked up a bunch of charities who fund people through university. And I basically wrote off a whole heap of begging letters and I duly got an interview with one charity. And I thought, well, I've only got one shot at this. And when they asked me, so why should we fund you through, you know, to get through university to get a to get a, a degree, I said, well, that's because I'm going to get a first. Now I was in, I was three weeks into my university degree, a four-year degree. There was no way that I could know that. You know, to um, know that but, we have international speak, speakers, what does a first mean? Maybe you should tell us what that what does that mean? It's it's what you call a magna cum laude, I think. So okay, so top, that you're going to be a top student. Yes. Yeah. And, and I very much, um, I delivered on that promise in the sense that uh, I did graduate with a double first and I felt that I, I, I needed to do that really to pay back the incredible faith that this organisation had had in me and the, to, to fund me through university. I thought they were incredibly kind to do so. Well, that is an amazing story. And I just can imagine this young girl of just 17, you know, you were, just, you were young and having the chutzpah to do that and also for someone to listen and that actually did happen. So, you know, as part of your, your, your journey, your odyssey, um, you know, many children, I imagine, of the Holocaust uh, dream of finding a trunk full of documents, letters, and photos in the attic that provides answers to the questions they could never quite bring themselves to ask their surviving relatives. And you actually did find that trunk. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that? So I've explained my father was a difficult person and when he died in 2017 uh, my sister and I had to go to his cottage and clear out the cottage. Now this was not an easy task in that there were papers everywhere. My father was a hoarder, he never threw anything away and he had everything from very banal things like jottings of train times to extraordinary documents that we discovered things like he had um, hired private detectives to track his two daughters, to track my sister and track me. And we found reports from these private detectives um, about our boyfriends at the time. I mean, it was a very strange thing to find. And I think it was done huh. out of love by my father. So he wanted, do you think it was protective on his home. part that he was trying yeah. to protect you? Yes, okay. But you had no idea that he had done this. No. No, oh it was God. very controlling and rather shocking. Um, so that that was that those were some of the papers that we found. And we also found stacks and stacks of Nazi era documents. So my father had spent much of his adult life uh, pursuing claims for restitution of assets. And they were to some extent ever more far fetched, these claims. And with ever decreasing amounts of success, uh, he'd pursued these claims. And so I think he, you know, we, I had a lot of documents that I needed to sift through. And we eventually took away those that we felt were, were relevant to, you know, to, 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 to hold on to. But it was, it was not an easy task sifting through this stuff. Well, so your, your father went through, I mean, I think you call it a dislocation. I mean, he, they lost everything. I mean, you want to talk yeah. a little bit about that and how do you think that impacted him? 
that of course, with that historical trauma, how that impacted you and your sister? So my, my family were a, a Jewish family in Western Austria, and this was an area which was very different to Vienna. Most people think when they think of, Vienna, of, of Austria, they think of Vienna where there were a lot of Jews. In Western Austria, there were very, very few Jews. Innsbruck had fewer than 500 Jews at the time. Um, and my family, mo most of these Jews were, were well-to-do merchants and business people. And my family had a distillery and a jam factory. And, you know, they, they were very assimilated. There wasn't even a synagogue in Innsbruck. There was hmm. merely a prayer room. And they lived peacefully and very happily amongst their neighbours. And there was, you know, little in the way of overt anti-Semitism through the 20s and 30s. Uh, however, this stuff, this anti-Semitism was clearly lurking beneath the surface. And you get to 19, the 1930s, the, and, and, uh, late 1930s, and the rise of Hitler, and you already see an awful lot of um, flags going up and, and marches outside the cafe. And my grandfather had, had founded a cafe in 1922 when he'd returned from the First World War. And it was the, the centerpiece of, of Innsbruck, if you like. It was where anyone and everyone went to celebrate. Yeah, so we can you tell us more down. about the cat? I mean, because I mean, that's in the title of your book and, and maybe even a little bit about your grandfather and what that might have been like to be there during those times. So the cafe was very special. Um, it was, it was the, the, the social hub, if you like, of Innsbruck. Um, it was where people went to dance, it was where they fell in love, it's where they drank coffee and ate beautiful cake. And even in the early 1980s, when I went to school in Innsbruck, um, the cafe had not existed for decades at the time. Um, when I was at school there and I mentioned my name to people, they would go, oh, Schindler, the cafe Schindler. I used to dance all night there. And so this was very much in the, in the, in the, so in, it was, so it was, in people's memories. So it was connected to really positive memories about life pre-war. Yeah. And it, it was a beautiful place and it had a, a fantastic coffee house. It had a, a shop. It had two ballrooms, a billiard room. Um, and, a, a, and a bridge room. So, you know, it was a substantial undertaking, this place. And they had you know, ballroom dancing there and, and competitions and all sorts of things went on there. But of course, um, despite being, or perhaps because it was so successful, when the Nazis arrived in 1938, one of the first things they did was, was force my grandfather to sell the cafe at an undervalue to a Nazi. Now, the, the chap they sold it to was a chap called uh, Franz Hebel, and he then promptly renamed the cafe, Cafe Hebel. And then it turned, it, it reinvented itself, if you like, as a Nazi officer's drinking club. Um, it was no longer the case that jazz poured from the window on a summer evening, as my grandfather had had, had it, but you know, they now they now played Nazi you know, drinking songs and um, you know, engaged in in sort of you know, their own, their own species of, of celebration, if you like. And um, at the end of the war, uh, the, the Nazis, or the senior Nazis in, in Innsbruck largely went into hiding. And um, the cafe was eventually given back to my grandfather, who very, very unusually returned to Innsbruck. Um, it's fair to say that very few uh, Austrian Jews returned to Austria, but he was one of the very few. And do you have any idea that why he decided to do that? Or is there anything in the records that um, I think prompted he, him to do that? I, I think he returned because he loved Austria. He loved the Tyrol and he loved the mountains. So he, he returned and he, the, the, the cafe had actually been closed due to war damage towards the end of the war. And um, he re rebuilt the cafe from, from the rubble and reopened his wonderful cafe. But sadly, he died in 1952 and my father inherited the cafe with his cousin. My father promptly fell out with everyone and the cafe was duly sold. The name limped on a little bit for a couple of years and then eventually completely disappeared from the high street. So I just wanna say, I wanna ask you a question though at this moment. Now, today, if someone would go to Innsbruck, would there be a Cafe Schindler? There is a cafe because Can 10 you years ago. Tell us a little bit uh, about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's an incredible story because 
about 10 years ago, a young restaurateur wanted to open a cafe in the very same building on the main street in Innsbruck. And he knew nothing about the family. And no matter where he went, whether it was the licensing office or the planning office, or his talking to his brother-in-law, no matter who he spoke to, everyone said, my friend, it has to be called Cafe Schindler. He was like, who are these people? Anyway. This so, is 50 um, years later. That's the other thing. This is not just 10 years later. This is like 50 years or more later. Yes. That's extraordinary. And so he went to the local archives and typed in the name Schindler and was suddenly confronted with something that had real heritage. He saw all these photos from the 1920s and 30s. And so he decided to deck out his own cafe in a 1930s art deco style. And it is now a thriving business and back on the high street. It's called Dust Schindler, the Schindler, like the Schindler's place, if you like. And he's doing a roaring trade. And although I don't have shares in it and I'm not an owner, I love the fact that the cafe is back. And next year it will celebrate its 100th anniversary. And oh, you're actually, going. You're going to go, I hope. I'm definitely going. Oh, maybe I'll go there. Uh, maybe I'll meet you there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We'll, we'll have, we'll have <laughs> The end there, and Look, it's incredible because it's the only previously Jewish owned business that is still going in Innsbruck. Well, and that is really it's that's really connected to the question I have. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Is that can you tell us a little bit about the meaning of the cafe to you personally and how you come to see it as a symbol of the resilience of the Jewish people? I think the very fact that it's there a hundred years later gives you some sense of why I think it's uh, a symbol of resilience and and of uh, I suppose of Jewish commerciality you know it's I'm proud of the fact that it's there um, and I I, I I truly believe that you know the, the cafe was very much an eyewitness to an extraordinarily difficult time in Austrian history so when it was founded um, Austria, just after the First World War, was, was pretty much destitute. It, the empire had collapsed and Austria was left with a rump state. And in the North Tyrol in particular, they were really traumatized because the North Tyrol had been separated from the South Tyrol. And the South Tyrol, which is now lies in Italy, had been given to the Italians. Previously, it belonged to the Austrian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that, that loss of land and the loss of, of everything that made for the North Tyrol has made life worth living. All of their products came from the South Tyrol, the olive oil, the soft fruits. Um, and and they, they'd come over the Brenner Pass into the North Tyrol. So losing the South Tyrol was um, extraordinarily traumatic, I think, for the North Tyrolers. And it also- And that included that, Innsbruck, the people in yeah, Innsbruck. Yeah, and Innsbruck, Innsbruck is in the North Tyrol, I should have yes. said you're right. Yes. And, and I think for them, that meant that they they were destitute. They felt um, destitute. My, my grandfather's reaction to this after the traumas of the First World War, arriving in this town that was now destitute, was to open this cafe and to create this extraordinary oasis of fun in the midst of this trauma. And I think <laughs> and that's him, your legacy, Muriel. He has must have had a spark of the like that gist of life, right? That this all this suffering had happened, and yet he was going to bring something to this part of Austria again that really, you know, imbued some of the the wonder of, of the human spirit, the dancing, the joy. And do you think yeah. that was part of your grandpa's um, um, essence? Yes, absolutely convinced. I mean, all the photos I have of him, I never met him sadly because he died before I was born. But um, all the photos I have of him are, he's, he's a smiling man. He's a man who has a real zest for life. He loves the mountains. I've got pictures of him. He's taken his top off and he's spread eagled in the snow because he just loves the mountains and he loved his cafe. I, I love the way that you express it. Um, for our listeners, if you could see her face, that her face just lit up with a big smile as she's describing her grandfather in the snow, and she has a wonderful smile. So I have to say, Mariel, I can see the resiliency that you are carrying forward from your grandfather to you right now as you tell me the story. But I wonder if we can just segue into maybe something that's a little bit more difficult. And your dad was such a character, and 
there was lots of reason to be very angry at him. And you have reflected that you spent much of your adult life angry at him. So one of the personal reflections others have shared with me is the exploration of rich family history often gives new context to parental characteristics that plagued them in their life and also plagued them in their youth. And certainly you told us about your self-reliance. So how has this, I mean, so has this been your experience? And if so, have your reflections new meanings for you about your father's behaviors and your reaction to them? Because you've told me you're not angry at him any longer in the way that you were. No. So let, let's deal with the anger first. So I, I, I was always a bit angry with my father because he told all these stories and he, there was never, there never seemed to be any foundation to them. And he'd led us such a song and dance as a family and and it had been so you know so traumatic because we'd had to flee from country to country we were being pursued by bailiffs and creditors right left and center so it had been a very unstable childhood um so you know I was always cross about that and I could never really feel I was getting truthful testimony from him he, he made, he, you know, he, he made out that we were related to a lot of people. So, you know, we were supposedly related to Franz Kafka and to Oscar Schindler and to Alma Mahler, the wife of Gustav Mahler. Even Bruno Kreisky cop, cropped up a few times, the, the post-war president of, the, of, of, of Austria. But My goodness, these, that would be quite a legacy. <laughs> so I mean, obviously on, not all of it's true, but maybe some of it's yeah. true. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, we're not, I don't believe, related to Oscar Schindler. Um, and um, Franz Kafka, so distantly, it, it's ridiculous to even claim any kind of um, real relationship. But, you know, we're certainly not related to Alma Mahler and not related to Oscar Schindler. And then there were two very central stories that he told. And um, one I believed and one I did not believe. And I think they are very good good sort of examples of what went on so the story that he told that I believed uh, was that um, on in, in November 1938 the, the evening of the 9th to the 10th of November um, commonly known as Kristallnacht and can you my, explain what that was because that was a very important part of the history not yeah. everybody may know what that means yes so Kristallnacht was a very brutal pogrom which was which happened which occurred throughout the German Reich where um, basically Jewish property was smashed up and it was done with a view essentially to frightening Jews into leaving. The, the Germans basically at that point in time were not out to kill Jews, they wanted them to leave the German Empire. And the, the, the and Kristallnacht was a basically an organized uprising against the Jews. And it's called Kristallnacht after the shards of broken glass that ended up on, on the streets. Um, most people, I mean, some people now call it, t t try to call it the November pogrom, because I think it is, it was basically a pogrom. Yeah. And the, my father told the story that age 13, he was in the flat that night and there was a banging on the door and some Nazi thugs came through the door and that they picked up my father's childhood toboggan, which was one of those beautiful wooden hooped toboggans with metal um, around the edge, and they smashed it over my grandfather's head. Now, the only problem with this story is that the attack took place. The only problem with this story is that my father was never there. Oh my goodness. So, and so, but that's the way even you describe it. it must have been so etched in your mind as a child to tell such a graphic story but he wasn't ever there. So he had made that story, that part of it. So what so, do you, did you find out what really happened? Yeah. No, the, the, the attack happened. It certainly happened um, because the people who attacked my grandfather were prosecuted in, the, in after the war. But my father, I have incontrovertible evidence that my father was in London. Now, he was only 13. And it may be that he in some way felt guilty for the attack and that he believed he was there but he clearly was not there. I know he was not there, despite the fact that he went to psychiatrists and got psychiatrist reports where he describes the fact he was there, but I know mm. he was not there. Interesting. 
you know, I just also, I want to um, also educate our audience because, um, you know, we, we've, I mean, we both are, we're a, a similar in age, um, grew up with a lot of knowledge about a lot of things, but I want to just give the definition of what a program is. It's a Russian word, which was, uh, which when directly translate means to wreak havoc. And they were typically described um, the violence by first by Russian authorities against Jewish people, but then it was widened to um, the organized massacre of of Jews and other ethnic groups. Now it's actually expanded right from the original Russian um, that and also that happened in Eastern Europe, the programs in Eastern Europe and Russia to the Jews and others. So I just wanted to give that bit of an explanation. No, that's, good. that's, that's absolutely right. And in fact, one of the bloodiest pogroms was, was actually in Innsbruck where uh, two people died that night and one person died shortly afterwards. Um, but it wasn't primarily to kill Jews, the, that, that, that particular organized violence, it was to frighten them. To frighten them. But so that imprint that that story left on you, can you just talk a little bit more? I mean, when you, when you live with a kind of lived history, you know, and also I'm, I'm also, another thought has come to me that I, I don't want to forget is that um, here you are a lawyer and I, you know, my husband also was trained as a lawyer and um, they are, you're trained to, uh, really to look after the truth and to try to discern what is truth and what is not truth. And we have court systems that were based on similar foundation in the UK as well as in the United States. And um, so I'm just also kind of bowing to you right now, my appreciation of you that you chose to be a lawyer who is yeah. really the seeker of truth. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you've made those connections I imagine you have um yeah. but <laughs> Elaine, you are not the first person to say, this, to, to say that you're to you I imagine on. not you're spot on of course I became a lawyer because I needed to make sense of the world and I think uh law is a wonderful way of helping you make sense of the world as it gives you a framework to analyze the world and um uh, yes, I think uh, uh, lawyers are often seekers of truth. And so, and lying. with that thought, I know I see that it's time for a break. Lawyers are often the seekers of truth. We are going to be back after the break, talking to more um, of, of hearing more from Muriel Schindler and her amazing odyssey. And we are going to hear more from her about the Cafe Schindler and the Odyssey, and oh, most importantly, the things that she's learned and the new family that she encountered in different parts of the world, including the United States. So um, we will be back in a few moments with more wisdom from Muriel Schindler. All right, great job. We're all clear. Back in a couple minutes. Thank you so much, Matt. So, oh my goodness, you are so wonderful to interview. I'm having the most delightful time hearing these stories. Look at all this cascade of wisdom coming out of you, Muriel. Oh my. Good, good. I'm very glad. Have, so, have you have you done many interviews yet? Are these are you just starting to do them? Um, yes, I've done some really interesting ones. Um, so some have been on radio, some have been recorded. Um, I've done a lot of Zoom stuff with um, sort of various synagogues and stuff. Not much in California, interestingly. Well, um, I, it's interesting that your law firm has a has a. Is it in Los Angeles? <laughs> In Los Angeles, I know. Oh my know. gosh! Well, you know how you're gonna have to tell them. You know, once you need to come over to LA, and then you can come and we can have dinner I'll, here we'll as well. Definitely have lunch. Definitely yes. have lunch. Next time you're coming through London, you can come and stay. Yes. With us. No, I hope to. I, I do a lot of work in Belfast as well, with I my imagine. nonprofit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Um. So the the second story, the one we need to get on to. Of okay. Course, let's let's doctor, let's make sure we get to that one. Yeah. It's the Doctor Bloch story. So I said there were two stories. One I believed, which turned out not to be true. And that's uh, the one you just told. Is yeah, that the that's one you just told? Just okay. Told. Uh, so, but you know, but maybe when we come back, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about what that may, meant to you when you found that it wasn't true. I was there's, wrong. Yeah. I was shocked. I mean, you, you don't, you know, Jews are not supposed to lie about what they have, what happened to them in the Holocaust. I mean, that's just not done, is it? I mean, yes, you know, no. I mean, good. so, and so then I think it would be good to elaborate upon that. Let's, so when we come back, I'll just say, well, I'm just wondering if you have any, a little bit more to say about the story that you found out was it's not true. Shocking. It's yeah. very shocking. Um, the fact that he lied about the fact he used it for his own ends, I think is very shocking. Um, okay. 
But at the same time, because he's not here, I have to give him the benefit of the doubt because, you know, memory is a very tricky thing. It is tricky. And it's not date stamp it's video tricky. tape. And, you know, you have to, you have to give him a degree of latitude because I think that he, he may, he may have come to believe the fact that he was there. well and we don't know what his relatives said because sometimes adults say oh remember this happened to our family and so you hear the story so much and because um you know it's called explicit memory can be so distorted over time yeah that we can fill things in that we think may have happened that actually didn't happen yeah. so that could be you know that's the other part of it and i think that's also your you you know that sounds to me about having some compassion towards your father yeah. of just saying what you said. So I think, you know, that might be something that we'll, we can talk about when you come back, but let's talk about, so, you know, what that, how story, that landed on you. Yes. And the other story so, is the story. And the of, other story is the, is the Dr. Bloch story, which okay. the fact, and that sort of seemed totally incredible and not believable, which was that my father's uncle was a Jewish doctor who treated Clara Hitler and was therefore sort of, um, and, and Hitler himself, as, as an adolescent and and therefore was in some way protected by Hitler and eventually you know emigrated to New York um but very 10 seconds time. 10 seconds okay thank you and was that a true story too yes and that was true okay. so there's okay, we've got two very different stories one I thought oh my. that to be untrue and one that was true but I never believed okay well, we'll talk about that as we come back This is Resiliency Within with Elaine Miller Karras. To reach the show during our live broadcast, please call in to 1 866 472 5792. That's 1 866 472 5792. You may also send an email to Elaine at resiliencywithin.com. Now, back to this week's show. This is Elaine Miller Karras. We're back today with Mariel Schindler talking about her amazing book, The Lost Cafe Schindler. And we uh, will hear more stories from her and the meanings of, you know, what she discovered during her odyssey. We, we just finished talking about um, the story that um, she had heard many times from her father about the night of the program that occurred in November many moons ago. And so um, can you tell us a little bit more about how the meaning of finding out that wasn't a true story and here you had heard it so many times from your father during your childhood. Yes, I mean, I when I worked out that my father was not actually present when his father was beaten up, I was very shocked, to be honest, because it it seemed it seemed unseemly that someone would lie about witnessing something so traumatic. But I then did quite a lot of reading about memory and you know, my father's no longer here to ask. So no, I have right. to give him the benefit of the doubt in that he may have come to believe that he was there. He may have told this story so often that it became in some way imprinted on him. Human memory is incredibly fallible. I have learned that through being a lawyer. When I uh, take a witness statement from someone, I have to be very, very careful about what they are telling me. It's not because they're deliberately lying necessarily, but they may just be mistaken. And I think that is one of the interesting things about that story in that it did take place. My grandfather was beaten up, but my father was not present. That is the bit that was interesting. Right, and, and I think what's important about what you're saying, and, and you know that I'm an old trauma therapist, and having seen that many times, there's something called explicit memory. And sometimes if we hear stories over and over again, and also because explicit memory over time can be distorted, and maybe if we hear those stories, sometimes we can start to believe that we were there because it was such an important kind of family history that night that um, really was trying to take every Jew out of, out of Austria and what that meant for the family and how it changed the family forevermore. So yes, I think you're, very, and very I, so. well, and the other thing that, that touches me, Mariel, is that I know that you have, you had been angry at your father and there's been a transformation of that anger, but I also hear your compassion towards him, that even though it may have been shocking when you found that it wasn't true, 
that you do have an explanation that certainly does make sense that could have been part, we don't know for sure, but it's yeah. certainly, you know, because he would have been just a child himself when this was happening. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's right. But he yeah. certainly, I mean, he used, it was convenient that he used the story for his own ends to explain away, you know, the fact that he was constantly in debt and in trouble with authorities. So, you know, it was, it was part of, very much part of his self-narrative, if you like. But you're right, there, there yes. is explicit memory, there is false memory, there's all sorts of explanations. And he may have come to believe that he was there. And I have to, I have to give him the benefit of the doubt. There. Well, and I think that, you know, when we're saying this, you know, this, my show is very much about the resiliency within how we cultivate well-being. And that doesn't mean that we don't do a deep listen to some things that have happened to us. And that if we have, like you said, spent a lot of your adult life being angry, but what I'm also hearing so much from you today is also the transformative experience of doing it, you know, really having the, um, the odyssey of looking into your family history and even having this vista of him in a different way that, you know, he may also have had his own elements of torture that he could have shrouded with the kind of way that he presented himself, certainly not to excuse the behavior. And I, I think that you would know that when I'm talking to you about that, but it does give a lens of how war and pogroms and really people who are trying to destroy one's life and, you know, one's whole way of being how that can play imprints on us and i yes, know there's a, a yes yeah and i know there's another story that also is important for you to tell and can you tell us a little bit about the doctor that is was related to you that apparently had a very famous uh patient indeed indeed thank you elaine i so so i told the story of the of, of the november pogrom as a story that I believed, but turned out not to be true because my father was not there. And then at, almost at the other end of the spectrum um, was the fact that my father also told a story about his Jewish uncle working in Linz in Upper Austria, who in 1907 had a middle-aged woman visit him in his surgery. And the woman complained of terrible chest pains and he was a good doctor and he knew pretty much what the problem was. Uh, he took her name, Clara Hitler, and then he examined her and diagnosed her as having advanced breast cancer. And he didn't tell her that this was pretty much a death sentence at the time, but he said to her, I will give you some painkillers, come back in a day or two with your family and I will explain what needs to happen. And sure enough, a couple of days later, uh, Mrs. Hitler, Clara Hitler, comes back to the surgery with her children in tow, including young 17-year-old Adolf Hitler. And the good doctor explains uh, what is, what, that, that there is a you know, very serious issue and that Clara Hitler has breast cancer. And at this point, he describes how Adolf Hitler bursts into tears and is clearly incredibly upset and adores his mother. And um, young Adolf Hitler asks, you know, is there no hope for my mother? And the good doctor says, well, there is a radical operation that can be performed. It is not certain, but, you know, we will do what we can. At which point Adolf Hitler says, everything must be done for my mother. And she is then taken off to be operated on. She has a double mastectomy. Um, the doctor, Dr. Bloch, is there throughout the operation and then immediately visits the children afterwards and explains that the operation has gone as well as can be expected. Um, Clara Hitler makes a, a bit of a recovery. She, she lives for another year or so uh, before she eventually dies in 1908. Um, the good doctor is very much someone who is visited by Hitler. He, Hitler comes back to the surgery to give his thanks. He tells the doctor that the Hitler family will be forever grateful. And when uh, he moves to Vienna, he sends from Vienna a couple of postcards to Dr. Bloch, you know, some of which he's painted himself. As we know, he spent time scraping a living a bit as an artist in Vienna. And he would sign the postcards, uh, you're eternally grateful, Adolf Hitler. And the doctor kept these postcards and roll on to 1938 when Hitler arrives back in Linz in Upper Austria. 
Um, it's fair to say Linz was his favourite city. He didn't like Vienna at all, but Linz was a place that he knew and loved. When he arrived back in Linz um, to cheering crowds, um, that one of the things that he asked his cronies was whether his house doctor, Dr. Bloch, was still alive. Oh my goodness. And they said, <laughs> yes, Dr. Bloch is still alive. At which point he is reported to say uh, that, well, if all Jews were like Dr. Bloch, we would not have a Jewish problem. So this is a quite extraordinary relationship. And what, you know, obviously, the, you know, things become progressively um, more difficult for the Jews of Linz. Uh, the businesses are closed down. There's a very familiar story as elsewhere in the German Reich. Um, but Dr. Bloch is left entirely protected. So he doesn't, he has still has a phone, he has his ration cards, he can go shopping when he wants. So he's left entirely protected. And even when he is, when all Jews are told to put a star of David outside the surgery he he is told to take take the star down so he interestingly he's he's, he's he, you know and he says well, i'm not going to do this you know you can do that if you're going to take it down and he, he makes the ss officer remove um the, the star from outside the surgery so again a very you know a very interesting story now of course i never believed this story because it seemed too incredible well, it seemed but, well and yes but this now could you tell us how you found this story to be true was it in well, the archives that your father had or so could right. you share about that because this is fascinating and also a very important historical fact that I think needs to also now we have it in your book but I mean this is another piece of this um, so, extraordinary so right, time. The, the, the story turned out to be completely true. Um, so Dr. Bloch emigrated eventually to New York where he died in the late 40s um, before he died he wrote an, his own autobiography. And that is now at the Washington Holocaust Museum. So you have a great big wadge of paper which describes all of this at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And um, there are archives in Linz where you can trace this as well. So it is, it is completely true, this story, but it is one that I certainly didn't believe when I was growing up because <laughs> it seemed ridiculous. Well, but I have <laughs> had all these anecdotes basically where I was trying to work out when after my father died which what was true and what was not true and so I'm just curious so did you end up meeting um relatives I know that in in uh, in the United States as a result of your odyssey and did it come out of learning about the dear doctor yes indeed um so my father I had always grown up with a very very small family um, my father had managed to fall out with most people um, in his family. And so after he died, I went about recontacting people to see if I could establish contact, to find out what they knew, to essentially find out some of the truth in the anecdotes. And I, 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 I found one, one, one chap, um, a cousin, who I made some tentative contact with, first of all by email and then by phone. And I plucked up the courage and I flew to the US to meet him. Um, this was an interesting meeting uh, as when I stepped across his threshold in his lovely house in Massachusetts, uh, his first words to me were, I remember your father. He was a crook and a shyster. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and he still opened the door to you. <laughs> That's saying <laughs> something about him. <laughs> yes. So what was your reaction to that? He was a crook and a shyster. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Bearing in mind I'd just flown 3,000 miles to meet this man, um, I decided that I was sort of, you know, um, discretion was the better part of valor. I think that say. would be a very wise <laughs> pathway for you there, especially if you're in his house. Yes, yes. Anyway, so he then sat me down, made me some lovely coffee, and we bonded enormously um, because he had some extraordinary photos that I had not yet seen, and some of which are in the book and credited to him. And he gave me one particular photo, which is an absolutely beautiful photo of 1912, around 1912 of my family, of my great grandparents and their children, including um, my, my grandfather. And um, it's just, you know, as we both looked at our shared great grandparents, I think that was just a very special moment. 
and so I that met- connection you you yeah. know that human connection saying we may have had very different lived experiences in different parts of the world and those two people we came from yes that absolutely. must have been very moving it was a very special moment and I have since tracked down um, a whole bunch of other cousins, most of whom didn't know each other, even though they weren't living that far apart. One in Boston, who I'm in regular contact with, one in Washington, um, a couple more in Connecticut. Um, And it's been amazing, absolutely amazing. And one of the really beautiful and therapeutic things about writing a book is that you you can bring people together. So I made very sure that when I was writing it, I wasn't writing anything they would be upset about. And I tried very hard to bring people together, which I believe I have done, and they are now very much in my life. And I, I very much value that. Well, and we were talking too about your journey, your odyssey. And um, one of the questions I have for you is that, you know, when did things start shifting for you when the angry, the anger started leaving you? Was there a certain part of the journey where that uplifting happened? And if you'd be willing to share that with us, I think it might be uplifting to others because I imagine there are many people out there that may be very angry at, a, at their mother or their father that may have not been the mother and father that they had expected and harmed them in the way that your dad had harmed you. And yet something happened to you that you were able to let go of that. So Please share, Muriel, as much as you'd like about that. I mean, I think the act of sorting out fact from fiction and working out what had happened and what he must have felt. I mean, you know, the refugee experience is a really difficult experience. He was a spoiled, you know, wealthy child, age 12, um, when the Nazis walked into Austria. And losing that over a couple of months, seeing his father in jail, um, fleeing and being a refugee and a poor refugee in London, I think must have been very traumatic for him. So trying to think through those things. And one of the things I did quite a lot of was basically walking in people's footsteps, Um, you know, spending time in Innsbruck, spending time up in the mountains where my grandfather fought on on the on the southern front in the first world war and trying to imagine what it was really like i think was incredibly important so to those people who who are angry um, with relations for one reason or another i would say that writing writing it down writing down the story is enormously therapeutic because i think what i'm i'm very calm about it now and i think that I don't say that everyone has the same journey at all. That would be extraordinary. But I do think that um, the the writing process is very curative. And what I've realized is that what my father gave me was essentially a very rich and very interesting history. And one that I'm very proud of now. So I think that was the gift essentially from him. You know, as you were just saying that I had another thought Um, that I hadn't asked you about. And that is, it almost seems like your dad was, like you said, was trying to reclaim something that he was lost. He had been a child of of wealth. And what I see that's clear from from your journey and also from this reclamation of relatives and even the letting go of anger and the compassionate stance towards him, you almost like you actually did what he wanted to do for himself, but couldn't. Yes, in, in the I mean, story, he, he never. I mean, he had various personality disorders and was narcissistic. I mean, I have this from from psychiatric records. This is not some cod diagnosis by me. Yes, um, and so you know, he was clearly not that well. Um, but for me, I am able to distance myself from that, which I think is is quite important, and understand that you know he lost a lot um, as a teenager. And whilst he was able to reclaim some of that through restitution proceedings, he never quite attained the standard that he expected, had expected of himself. And so he never quite got there. Whereas what I've done is not not pursue restitution proceedings because, you know, they were they were, you know, something that lay far in the past. Um, But where I was able to reconcile, in a sense, what 
he had said with the truth and able to, in a sense, reclaim a sense of ourself as a family. Yeah. So, yeah, I, so really reclaim your sense as a family and to even have that expanded family. Yes. Um, and so I guess I also wanted to ask you about your sister. You know, oftentimes when two siblings go through this uh, similar thing, that there can be a very strong relationship. People call it trauma bonding. Could you say a little bit about that too? Because I, I, I also appreciate the fact that you really wanted them to know what you were doing out of respect yes, to your family, much, which yeah. is something that your dad didn't have that same respect towards, right? But you have that. Yes, no, my, my, my sisters have been very involved in the book and particularly my, my little sister. Um, so she is a, a graphic designer. She did an incredible family tree for the book, which is not easy to do at all for anyone who's tried to dis- depict a, a complex family on one sheet of paper. Um, she did an extraordinary family tree, which is in the book and credited to her. And she also helped enormously she, with design and, um, and, and just very much was with me through that journey. And I would ring her and say, do you remember X? And she'd go, <laughs> yes. yeah, but it wasn't quite like that. It was like this. And so you'd, you'd, you'd get a fused memory of what, what had actually happened. So it was very interesting. Um, and I'd, I'd ring her and say, you're not going to believe, and this has been on for three years, <laughs> you're not going to believe what I've just discovered. You go, oh, what is it now? <laughs> <laughs> you definitely have had a passion for doing this. I mean, it's like you put, it's almost like all these puzzles were thrown out into space and you were able to put the puzzles together. Oh, absolutely. That made absolutely. sense of your life and his life and all that he um, was trying to do. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I fear that his life was very much one of of searching for restitution, whereas perhaps what he should have been searching for was reconciliation of some sort. Right. You've done that. And I I just want to really, I guess, really pay homage to you for doing that. We can't always change the facts of what our parents did to us. But I think that's what we're called to do is how do we reclaim the best parts of ourselves? And we all have different journeys up that mountain, right? Some of us may go to a therapist. Some of us may go on an odyssey of reclaiming the history of your family and writing about it as you've done. But I also want to say something about just the self-reliant young girl. Boy, do I like her. I like the, the fact that she was able to see that there was something in herself that was beyond the suffering that she had experienced. And that chutzpah inside of you was there and certainly seems like it's there now too. So I just think that um, what you have done is, is, is very brilliant. And I can't believe we're almost time. It's our, our, our time together is almost ending. It just has gone by so fast. But I wonder if there is one thing that you would want to leave with our listeners that has, is a very important thing for them all to know. If maybe they're facing a similar journey of anger and what you've learned. Um, I, do, I do think approaching approaching that sort of issue sort of methodically working through it whether that's with a counsellor or whether that's with a pen and paper is a is a good way of dealing with it um and the other thing I would throw out there is that you know the the book is a different way of looking at, at the whole holocaust story and it's not just about the holocaust you know I went for a run today and I was listening to the trauma of the refugees on the Belarusian border yeah. trapped in forests in the cold and you're thinking this is we shouldn't be doing this in the 21st century this is extraordinary that we've got refugees trapped in pockets all over the world like this and we need to have a more compassionate um, approach to dealing with the refugees who wash up on our coasts as in the UK um, or land on our borders if they're land borders and um, for that for that alone I think the book is is you know a, a reminder of what happens when we are not vigilant. And so I, I could not agree with you more. If we can have more compassion towards those who are suffering um, now, in the present moment, we have refugees all over the world. And how can maybe our listeners be part of reaching out and supporting, whether it's through a donation or just even awareness that this is existing right now. There are plenty of charities and nonprofits all over the world that are helping refugees. And maybe there'd be a child that could be helped that wouldn't have to face some of the suffering that your dad did that led to behaviors that weren't so healthy for him or your family. But I want you all to know that you can 
learn more about Mariel if you'd like to. She has a website, uh, MarielSchindler.com, that you can communicate with her. She's also on Facebook, Mariel Schindler, and she's on LinkedIn. Just put her name in there. And she's also on Twitter at Mariel Schindler. And I wish you great luck. And again, I'm so um, proud to be here on the day that your book was chosen to be one of the 10 most important reads during Hanukkah. So again, thank you so much. It's been a delight to meet you. And for our listeners, remember what is true about your life as well. We can see that Muriel didn't get stuck in the trauma. She started doing something to change the vista that she had grown up with through her own spunk and um, resilience. And I wish that for all of you as well. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next Monday um, for another journey with another guest. Thank you so much. It's Elaine thank signing you. off. All right. Great job today. All clear. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Mariel. It's such a love. I think if we lived in the same neighborhood, we'd be going for coffee on a regular basis. Oh, we would definitely. I would Yes. Oh my goodness. I would love that. But it's, it's just been a joy. And, you know, I, you know, keep me posted on if there's any other, you know, things that happen. And I will add this to your, I think it will be a very important thing to add to the um, description of this, of the uh, show. This yeah, no, honor that cool. we just had. Oh my goodness. Before, before the, the show started. So no, oh. it's lovely. Thank you very much. That was a well, lovely. I'm interview. so glad that that um, my executive producer, you know, he, they send me a lot of requests, but there was something about, I don't, I don't know, Cafe Schindler, Innsbruck, having been there and just yeah. then getting to meet you and 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 really again, really a very big hug to you about deciding to take this journey and to release yeah, that yeah, anger. It's been, it's been enormously, it's actually been enormously fun. I have loved the research. Well, process I can just see. Process. <laughs> well, it sounds like there could be more books in your future. If it's getting this, who knows? Who who knows? knows? It's hard to write a book. I'm doing the, the uh, second edition of my book and oh my goodness, but it's, it doesn't, it's a little bit different than your book, but this, your book had so much personal meaning in terms of your personal history. So anyway, thank you so much. And hope to You're see you, welcome. hope to run into you again well, in this life of ours. I will, I will look you up if I ever manage to make it out. To oh, the please do, because I'm very close to LA, very close yeah. to LA. Yeah, All right. No, absolutely. All right. Take okay. care. Okay. Thank you, Mariel. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.